This is where China and Russia can work together because uh, you know China is not comfortable to send its force to do force projection to send its uh, troops abroad. Unlike Russia, you know Russia has been providing security. We saw that in Central Asia. We saw that in Syria. But what China did is China bring investment into Central Asia. China brought an economic uh, lifeline to Assad, and 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 China is perfectly willing to have Russia to take. Uh, 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 you know, to take the front and center stage in providing security in these type, type of places. And, and you know, for me, rather than say they have the kind of the uh, bound by mutual uh, mad and mutual assured uh, destruction, is I see the Russian and Chinese economy are complementary, uh, you know, because Russia is a main commodity producer. China is a large import of energy. And, and, and right now, especially with U.S. Navy constantly talking about the blockade on uh, Strait of Malacca, where they're going to blockade the, the Chinese energy supply coming from Middle East, Russia provide a very safe conduit for, for steady energy supply into, into China. That, that will never be a threat. Uh, I mean, hey, what's it, you, you, what's U.S. Navy going to do? <laughs> Fly F-35 deep into the Russian-Chinese territory to bomb the rail lines and the pipelines? And that's ridiculous. Uh, and that's World War Three right there. And and so 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 I think Russia-China tie has never been better, because even more stable than during the Sino-Soviet honeymoon period in 1950. The, the Sino-Soviet honeymoon happened because the ideology, the two sides were talking about ideology, but there was a lot of under, there's a lot of problem underneath that was briefly smoothed over by ideology, but eventually emerged, and that caused a sino soviet split. But today, the Russian-China relationship is not based on ideology. It's based on mutual interest. I think in that, in that way, I an mean, interest-based relationship is much more stable because both sides knows what they're getting out of this. Right, but to, but to have a, a mutually beneficial um, relationship, there has to be trust. And trust has to be based upon um, an understanding uh, between the two where they, they, they recognize that they're different, but they, they embrace the differences. Um, what I saw in Russia and traveling there is that there's a lot of ignorance in Russia about China. And from that ignorance comes fear. You know, Russia is very concerned about the Far East um, and the fact that the lack of population there, the all the resources there, and they have this notion that China is somehow going to flood the border and come in and just uh, absorb it. Um, and also, a lot of Russia builds off of the uh, Sinophobia of the West. Um, you know, because there, there's a, a big part of Russia that was, you know, up until two years ago. Uh, very closely integrated with the West. Uh, you know, superficially, I'll give you an example. Um, the taxi cabs of uh, Moscow. Um, you know, when you when you call a car, a um, you know, car service, it used to be that you would get uh, Mercedes Benz or BMWs, and that uh, nobody wanted want to get in any car besides a Mercedes Benz and a BMW. And even today, there's still people that just want that, but it's becoming you know, very difficult to sustain. Uh, because the other thing about Moscow or the Russians is they're snobs. Um, meaning when they, when they have a car service, when they want a new car coming to pick them up. They're, they want they want a car that they get into and it's a comfortable ride. Um, just in between May and uh, in December, I, I saw just in that period of time uh, the transformation of the um, of, of the service car industry in Moscow uh, from a Mercedes-Benz BMW dominated, um, you know, market to one where Chinese luxury cars, Chinese luxury cars were now there and not just that, but driving around. And one of the things that happened to do this is the Russians have to become comfortable with the Chinese and they are, there's Chinese tourists in Moscow. Every place I went, there was Chinese tourists. And my understanding is that the Russians are starting to go to China as well. I know Russian businessmen now. I know Ru and every Russian businessman that I've spoken to who went to China comes back just amazed, just stunned. Um, because they, like everybody else, uh, have certain prejudices built in. Um, you know, they, they have certain assumptions built in based upon, you know, years of misinformation. 
Um, but when they go there and they see China, it's just like when I tell Americans to go to Russia. Um, I'm getting ready to do a, a tour of Russia uh, this summer. Um, the motto of the tour is, um, you know, from the Pacific Ocean to the Baltic Sea and everything in between. And it's basically to um, address the prejudice and the, the ignorance of the following statement. Yeah, Moscow may be a good city. St. Petersburg may be a good city. But everything outside of that is crap. Russia's run down. It doesn't work. It's broken. I've been to cities outside of Moscow, and that's not true. But now the purpose is to go over there and show from the Pacific Ocean to the Baltic Sea and everything in between is the real Russia and let people decide for themselves. You know, the Chinese are out there. The Chinese aren't just going to Moscow. They're in Novosibirsk. They're in Ekaterinburg. They're everywhere. And they're going there. They're seeing Russia. And they're coming back. And they're, they're talking about Russians in a positive way. Russians are going to China. And you're starting to break down this wall of ignorance and the fear that's generated from that. And from that, now when we speak of economic co-prosperity, there's going to be a trust because they they understand how China works. They understand who the Chinese are. The, Rus the Chinese understand how Russia works who the Russians are, and they've come together and they say, hey, we're comfortable with this peaceful coexistence thing, and we can turn it into a mutually beneficial relationship. And they will, and they are. And I just keep telling the Americans, man, we got to do the same thing. You know, the best way to prevent a conflict with either Russia or China are to travel to Russia and China and meet the Russians and Chinese people and to recognize that they are just humans like us. They might yeah, their skin color might be different in the case of China. I don't know. That was a very racist thing to say. But uh, their language would be different. Their cultural things would be different. They might dress differently. But at the end of the day, we're the same people. You sit around a table and you tell jokes, uh, and we're going to laugh. The humor is humor. The things that make Chinese sad make Americans sad. The things that make Chinese happy make Americans happy. And once we realize that, and we realize that we're the same people, that there's no reason to have this fear and this this, this animosity, suddenly we're not spending a trillion dollars on defense anymore. And we're figuring out how to, how to work with it. Because see, we fear you. We fear you because you're so damn good at your, your, your economic stuff. Janet Yellen just came out and she admitted you guys do it better than we do. And she's mad at you because you're doing it better than we are. You're mad that she's mad at you because you outcompete us. Well, again, I mean, Chinese are good businessmen. Of course they are. I mean, they wouldn't have gotten where they are today if they weren't. But part of a good businessman isn't to run down, um, you know, your, your, your potential customers or, or even your competitors. It's to find a healthy economic relationship. And that if the United States be willing to work with China, China would be more than happy to say, what can we do so that we both pros prosper together? Because, you see, if I'm going to be a Chinese consumer, I have to have money. And I have to also have my own industrial base. And China doesn't want to be a place that's only something you have to also consume. There has to be healthy interaction. There has to be a balance. And good businessmen understand the balance. China and Russia today are working on getting that balance. China can have that balance with America. America can have that balance with Russia. There's there's a whole big world out there today that, that we can find economic, you know, co-prosperity balance. But in order to do that, I got to sit down with you and talk to you and you got to feel comfortable with me. You got to trust me. I got to trust you right now. There's no trust. China and Russia are working through centuries of mistrust and they are solving this problem. And I think that um, anybody in the West that continues to believe that we can drive a wedge between China and Russia, I think they're just dead wrong. I don't think that China and Russia are going to have a wedge driven between them anytime soon. <laughs> A lot of people in the West, they don't even realize the Sino-Soviet split ended in 1989. I mean, they think they still think it, they can bring it back like that. And and I think, you know, what you said about people to people exchange, I mean, 100 percent. I, I think this is the reason Chinese government is actually rolling out a lot of the policies recently um, to to roll out unilateral visa free uh, policies for many EU countries. Um, and and uh, as well as the Southeast Asian countries like Malaysia and Singapore, I'm, I'm hoping they do it for United States, you know, or or at least for Indonesia. So my, my wife can go. But 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 U.S. is the one that U.S. State Department now lists China under travel level three travel advisory. So 
So right now, China is on the same level as the countries in the Civil War, like Ethiopia, right? <laughs> it's dangerous for America to travel, to, which is completely bogus. You know, you have uh, tons of... I I agree with you, Carl. You know, I, I, I'm sitting here right now in Guangzhou, and I'm going to tell you guys something that is absolutely amazing. I walked into the Guangzhou Canton Fair. It basically makes the Consumer Electronics Show look like a, a, you know, a small little lounge in an airport. Um, there is over 72,000 booths here. And you want to know what, were the, what was the number one language after Chinese here, Carl? What do you think? What do you think it was at this show today as buyers? Well, I mean, it's not English. Don't tell me it's Russian. Russian. I, mean, I would think no Russian. way. Wow. Everywhere wow. you go. My wife, uh, she speaks Russian as well. She turned to me and she says, this is unbelievable what is happening here. And uh, I tell you, I mean, you see it. The buyers are here. Uh, I mean, Scott has experienced it. I think you have experienced it, Carl. Even um, Alex Christoforu from the Duran said, you know, he went there and he says, what's, wow. I mean, the, the automobiles have been replaced <laughs> by Chinese product. And hey, when you sanction someone 16,500 times, what do, what do you think is going to happen? Um, you know, Bank of China is opening up many branches uh, throughout Russia right now. I mean, Exciting times ahead. Uh, 280 billion yeah. plus in trade. Fantastic. I'll hand it back to you, gentlemen. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm just happy they finally uh, allowed uh, WeChat and uh, Alipay to be hooked up with foreign credit cards. So you know, I don't have to rely on, on my auntie's Chinese bank <laughs> to, to, to 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 use mobile payment in China. But um, you know, recent the the people to ex people to exchange. You know, I I. I I'm thinking about my recent trip to Russia last summer. Uh, even, even me, I, I consider my I thought my I was immune to all the Western propaganda. I know there are tons of Western propaganda in against uh, against Russia, but I was genuinely surprised when I landed in Moscow and and you know when I landing a. I consider Moscow one of the most beautiful city in the world. I mean, I of all the places I travel to, I travel extensively inside the United States. I went to a couple of places in Europe, uh, Asia, China, but Moscow is absolutely one of the top uh, beautiful. I mean, you McCain, McCain likes to say, you know, Russia is just a giant gas station. Uh, with nuclear weapons, then it must be the most gorgeous, beautiful gas station ever seen. Because <laughs> because Moscow is beautiful, but I was surprised because just the fact that I saw Moscow in like brilliant colors. Uh, then I realized all the image I used to see in traditional uh, mainstream media, like Wall Street Journal, New York Times, CNN, about image from Russia is always gray. There's always they must apply some kind of gray filter because it's always gray and depressing. So I was actually surprised. You know, I was just as surprised as Tucker Carlson when he traveled to Russia to see. You know, Moscow is clean. It's beautiful. It's nice. You know, people. The shops are full. People have. Uh, people are just trying to leave, uh, lead normal lives. And, and 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 you know, I just read a, a recent news. You know, U United States and China are they are trying to renegotiate on uh, reopening the air routes, trying to bring them back to uh, like pre-COVID levels. But this this move has been rejected by the u.s airline because they claim that china has a uh, how we how we doing how are we doing for time there scott do you are you needed on another program or um we we can go we, we if we can wrap up in a in in in, in the next 10 minutes or so that'd be good <laughs> I got to okay. eat. Okay, I yield my time to Scott. Because <laughs> no, I can no, go no. forever. Okay. I, I, I like to yield my time to Scott. Yes. <laughs> I just think I, what you're saying. I yield so my time to Scott, to Scott Ritter. <laughs> no, I, I think what Carl's saying is, is just so important. Um, you know, that there's just, there, there's so much ignorance out there about China and such. Um, you know, I've talked with this about Alex before and, you uh, you know, I, you know, I'm not a Chinese expert. I'm not. Um, I, I know Chinese history. I, I, I'm familiar enough. But, you know, with Russia, I can honestly call myself a Russian expert. I've 
I've put the 10,000 hours that's needed to turn me from you know, superficial knowledge into an expert into this into this problem. But maybe not being a Chinese expert is the best thing in the world because I, I just feel like that th I'd love to go to China and do in China what I did in Russia, just to go and meet people and talk to people and see it and capture that experience and bring it back to the United States uh, to encourage more. You know, and maybe I'm the guy to do it because I don't care about the level three travel advisory. I mean, I'm not, that doesn't intimidate me. It doesn't scare me at all um, because I recognize it for what it is, garbage, garbage. Um, and it would just, I mean, for me to see China, because China, I would imagine is a lot like Russia. You know, a lot of people look at Moscow and say that defines Russia. Or they look at Moscow and St. Petersburg and they say those two cities define, but it doesn't. Russia is so damn big and so diverse, um, you know, and it's full of so many different ethnicities and religions and cultures. And they all come together in this wonderful thing called the Russian Federation. I just imagine that China um, is the same that you get outside of Beijing or you get outside of Shanghai um, and you and you start moving through China, you see uh, a country that has, you know, geographic diversity. I mean, I've just seen photographs of Chinese mountains and Chinese valleys and Chinese rivers that are just, you're just like, wait a minute, this is a painting or is this real? Um, the You get out into, you know, into the Western, into Western China where you see the interface with uh, Islamic communities. Um, and you, you, you know, the, the deep cultural traditions of, of Islam in China and how they get along with one another. You know, there's a lot of uh, stuff being said about the Uyghurs and there's a lot of stuff being said about other things. I'd like to see it for myself because you know what? I'm, I'm not a dunce. I'm not, I'm not a dupe. Um, I, I, I'm pretty good at uh, walking into a place going, is this real? Or is it Memorex? I mean, you know, are the Chinese pulling one over my eyes or is this real? Uh, I, I saw that in Tehran. I was a little concerned when I went to Iran for the first time. The only time I hope to be able to do it again. I got out of the Tehran airport and I just thought I'd be walking into a police state. Instead, I walked into normalcy. There was a taxi driver. He wasn't government driven. He, I just waved him down. He came. He took me to the... Everybody wanted to talk to me everywhere I went in Iran. I got out of Tehran and I'm going down a four lane super highway going, where the hell am I? <laughs> because this is better than the New York State Thruway connecting Albany with New York City. I got off at a uh, at an Iranian rest stop thinking that it was going to be third world fly stinky toilets. It's clean. The toilets are modern. The food is delicious. The gas pumps out on time. Everything's wonderful and you go into the different cities and villages nice people they want to talk to you and i just imagine that if i went to china i'd run into the same thing nice people who want to talk to you who are living normal lives i mean can we find bad things you know if i wanted to i could do a couple things here i could walk through my community and take photographs and show you um nothing but good stuff or i could walk through my community same community and take photographs and you'd say this is the dump of the world right here and where i live i can find things i and i can photograph things that would make all of this look really bad are there bad things in america you're damn right there are and i want us to fix them are there bad things in china i would say yes there are but i i confronted uh, somebody very close to me the other day uh, about russia and because they were talking about this trip i'm planning to make and they said well are you going to show balance I said, what do you mean by balance? Well, I mean, are you going to show the, the, the bad with the good? I said, but what do you mean by that? Because here I'll give you an example. I was in Sevastopol and um, walking around Sevastopol, beautiful city. And for three days, I just saw, you know, a, a city. I mean, I could, you know, I could find a chip in the wall and take a photograph of the crumbling infrastructure. Well, it ain't crumbly. I mean, there, you know, it's 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 a city that's been around for a long time. There's going to be places that they need to be repaired. That's okay. But the people are happy. Everything's clean. But we came out and there was a drunk on a bench, a drunk on a bench. He was clearly drunk. He was clearly sleeping it off. Now, I could have taken a picture of that and posted it and said, drunk on a bench in Sevastopol. This is the Russian reality. But was it? 
Was it, was that, would that be balanced to show that photograph or would that be sort of unfair to say, here's a photograph that I'm putting up all the photographs I could take of Sevastopol. This is the one that I choose to define the Sevastopol by. That's just not right. That's wrong. Um, now, if there was a whole bunch of drunks out there, if they had a skid row, maybe, maybe you could say Russia's got a drinking problem. And here it is, a click, click, a photograph, a drinking problem, because it's a real problem that manifests itself in a way that defines what I'm looking at. But one drunk on a bench doesn't define the problem, the problems that, uh, you know, beset Sevastopol or Russia. So, you, you know, you just have to be responsible in how you go forward and sell things. I'm not saying to become a cheerleader. The last thing I'd want to do for any audience that might want to track me through China is to become a Chinese cheerleader. Hey, look at China. Everything's great. Everything's wonderful. Rah, rah, rah. That's not it. I want to come in and I want to meet Chinese people. I want to, you know, if I, if I meet you and you take me to a restaurant that isn't a five-star restaurant, it's a two and a half star restaurant where truckers come in. Hey, guess what? China's got truckers and they're real people like our truckers and they come in with mud on their boots. They come in smelling of three days because they haven't taken a shower in three days because they're trucking. And they come in there and they don't have all the money in the world and they just want a good, decent meal. They sit down at a table and a waitress comes out who doesn't look like a supermodel. She's a real person. And she sits down and she puts food in front of you that's delicious, but it's not on fine china. Is this a bad thing? Nope. <laughs> it's china. It's real. It's as real as it gets, and it should be shown to people and embraced and seen for what it is. That, that's what needs to happen. We need to show people not the facade, but the, the, the reality. And the reality, I believe, is pretty damn good. In America, the thing that bothers me is that traveling around America anymore, I used to tell people that, you know, you come to America and you're going to see the good. And the good will dominate everything else. You'll see ugly things. We have problems in America. We got racism. We got poverty. We got a whole bunch of problems. We got crumbling infrastructure. But that you could come to America and without any guide, walking away, because people tend to gravitate to the norm, the mean. And if you gravitate to the norm, the mean of America, that middle average, it's good. And you're going, this, this is good. I know there's bad stuff over here. And I know there's a lifestyle of the rich and famous up here. But the stuff in the middle is pretty good. It, it defines America. We're running into a problem in America today where it's hard to find that mean anymore. That some that, that bad is coming in. Society is changing. And it's difficult to find that, that, that mean. In Russia, when I find that mean, it's good. It's good. I like it. I would imagine if I went to China, I would hope to find the same sort of, you know, average out uh, that that says this is good and the reason why i think it's important to show that to america isn't to say china's better than america but to tell americans that a lot of our problems comes from the fact that we are ignorant that we are shutting ourselves down in the world that we're not taking advantage of opportunities that could enable our life to get better you know we spend so much time trying to shut down TikTok and ban huawei phones and not realizing that you know TikTok's not a threat Huawei is not a bad phone. And if we stopped wasting time and energy, that maybe we could get better. We could make that mean a better mean. Um, look, if, if we're threatened by Huawei phone, build a better phone. I mean, look, if I, if I don't want a Huawei phone, find me a better phone. <laughs> that's called competition, baby. You know, Apple, Huawei, you, don't, you, you think that's a good product? Give me a better product at a price I can afford. That's called economic competition. And then Huawei is going to go, whoa, damn, Apple just beat us. We got to get a better phone, but we can't make it too expensive. We got the next thing you know, you have this com competition taking place. And who benefits? We do. We get good products at better prices. Uh, but that can't happen if you've walled yourself in and become ignorant. And I think the American people today have walled themselves in and become ignorant. And it's absolutely imperative that we get out there, see the rest of the world. Uh, the more we see, the more empowered we come with knowledge and the less we have to fear because fear is derived from ignorance break down the walls of ignorance stop being afraid learn together live together in peace peace and prosperity and who knows you may make some pretty cool friends i've made some russian friends right now that um i'm as close to as i am with any of my american friends and i would hope that someday i could make some chinese friends that are on that same level
I would welcome you to China. I mean, I, I highly encourage every anybody who is watching, who is listening, to come to China. I mean, like I I, I believe you guys will love it. Uh, yeah, I, I know Alex can show you around, Scott. <laughs> He's got all the connections. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, one of the problem right now is the the, the the air travel is actually expensive between China and United States because all the airlines have canceled their routes since the COVID time. And and when they're trying to bring it back to the pre-COVID level, all the American airlines are objecting because China, China this claim the Chinese airline have this unfair. Uh, anti-competitive uh, advantage because they can fly over Russian airspace and, and through the North Pole. I mean, this is completely self-inflicted. You know, the, the, all, the simple thing is get rid of the sanction on Russia that the American airline can also fly over the North Pole to, uh, through Russia to China. You know, I hope that day comes soon. Uh, you know, I can't, I can't wait for that day so, to come. So, so if I come to China, I'm going to have to fly through Novosibirsk. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I would, you know, why you can get a ten-year multiple entry visa to China because U.S. and China has this agreement, so you can get the multi ten-year multi multi entry uh, visa. And if, I'm assuming you already have Russian visa, so maybe you can. I don't have a Russian visa. I have to. Oh, <laughs> I have to beg for a Russian visa every time I visit. We're in the process right now of, of making sure the Russians still want me to come in their country. So. Uh, Look, get the three uh, year. Get the th you can get the three year multiple entry visa to Russia. I just want to go to China once first. And oh yeah, make, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, like it's easy. Make sure I get China. to come home and then. <laughs> China, China has this uh, oh, how the 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 one week transit visa for uh, like for major city like Shanghai, Beijing. If you can show that you have a return ticket getting out of China at the end of the week, you can go without visa. This is. I, I just want. I want. I want the. I want the month and a half good time visa. Abs absolutely and uh, that's exactly that's exactly that's exactly what you're gonna get definitely and i'll be there at the airport waiting for you um scott we're gonna let you uh close down your section and then uh we'll keep carl on for a bit but uh fantastic live stream tonight gentlemen man uh you know carl's been saying to me when are you gonna get me on with scott ritter and what a banger it was tonight uh Okay, Scott, I'll give you the next couple of minutes to say your goodbyes and everything, and then Carl and I will wrap up the show, but uh, we'll hand it over to you, sir. Well, again, Alex, thanks for having me on. And Carl, it was an absolute pleasure to meet you and, uh, and talk with you, and I look forward to, uh, to having continued conversations of this, uh, of this nature, and I want to thank your audience for, uh, for tuning in, and um, I'll see you guys uh, next time around. Thank you, Scott. I mean, that was awesome. I, well, I had a university level. You are you are on mute, Alex. You're on. Yeah, mute. I know. Uh, I got a university. Here. I got a university <laughs> level lecture. You know, I would just like you say I was. You have never hear hear me so silent on a podcast. I just enjoyed myself <laughs> listening to like his description of the Iranian missiles coming from different it's angles. It's unbelievable. <laughs> that that's I mean, amazing. Uh, you know, s sometimes I've just got to put it on, uh, you know, autopilot and sit back and backstage here and talk to Scott. I mean, I really appreciate everybody that's been tolerating me today. I'm not in my studio and I love being in my studio in Chongqing because I come at you with 1080 and uh, 30p per second or even 60 frames per second. Sorry, <laughs> visual. So what we're going to do here is I just want to round up the show here and also uh, say a special thanks to Carl Zaw's audience. Carl, just to note, you have over 2,061 people watching on X right now. Nice. OK, nice. <laughs> uh, your X is a four to one ratio on your YouTube channel. Uh, we broke over seven thousand this evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's been an absolutely uh, I call it a barnstorm barn buster of an evening here. I'm uh, coming at you guys live here in Chongqing or sorry, Guangzhou uh, and trying to hold everything together here. I'm in a very busy, busy city at the moment. Uh, it's it's big time. Uh, that's for sure. But a very interesting day uh, when you see uh, Carl, if uh, you were ever to come to uh, Guangzhou during the Canton Fair, it's a major, major attraction here in China. A lot of stuff that is going down in this city, everybody, Guangzhou. Uh, I know my heart is in Chongqing, but unfortunately, uh, I'm not there tonight, and I'm representing them definitely very well here at the show. 
But indeed, uh, if you come to Guangzhou around this time of the year, good luck getting a hotel. Good luck getting a taxi. But you want to be a buyer at this convention because it is mega. We are talking big, big, big time stuff, okay? I think it was six football stadiums the size of this uh, this uh, trading floor. I just, 70 I just I just remember I was in Guangzhou in June 2019. It was freaking hot, man. I was walking around along the Pearl River at 1030 at night and sweating bullets. I mean, I'm assuming now it's probably better. It's April, but I, oh. I, it's, it's hotter than Bali, Guangzhou in, so, in, in so July. So, Carl, thank you for uh, sitting on uh, autopilot with me uh, on the side here, getting schooled by Mr. Ritter on the program. I think it's a pleasure. And always, we need your support. It's very important that you do support our channels. Uh, we're, you know, I'm not coming on here saying, you know, we need it, we need it. But I'll tell you, uh, within a millisecond of after I end the stream button, YouTube definitely uh, starts demonetizing this video and all our hard work and efforts that we've put into this program. Not that we don't enjoy it, but sometimes we have some uh, things that we have to take care of. And uh, some of them are a little bit expenses to keep these shows going and stuff like that. So any support you guys can give us by Super Chat or buy me a coffee and all the other donation links are in it below. Okay, I don't need to go on to that much more. Um, Carl, uh, I'm going to say goodbye to you, sir. And I look forward to having a live stream with you soon, okay? Uh, and uh, you cool? You want to say anything to the audience before you leave? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, Alex said he doesn't <laughs> need it. He doesn't need contribution. I do. I need whatever <laughs> help I can get, <laughs> you know, to finance my lifestyle in Bali. So, yeah, I appreciate uh, all these uh, super stickers and all these. Books. Yeah. Uh, and, and they really do help guys, everybody. Yeah. And I just appreciate you guys tuning in to watch us because uh, it, it's good to know we're not talking to ether, you know, like, like we're not talking to air. So uh, <laughs> and, and this tonight, I mean, Alex, I got to hand it to you. That was amazing to have Scott Ritter on. I just, I could just sit and listen to him. You know, I don't have to say anything. Um, so, you know, you, you kind of forced me to, to say my piece, but I'd rather just sit here and with a smile on my face. So it was good times. Oh. Good time. but, 